All right, why don't we get started? Um, let me um, start by giving a um, quick introduction. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's conversation on marketing innovation with our friends, Jay Livingston, uh, CMO of Shake Shack, Jeff Weiser, the former CMO of Shopify and Shutterstock and current operating partner at private equity firm El Catterton, um, and Dave Knox, uh, CEO, investor, um, author of Predicting the Turn, the high stakes game of business between startups and blue chips. My name is Stu Wilson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Radical. And uh, before I hand it off to Dave and our panelists, a quick introduction. Um, so who are we? We are a new market insights company that helps the innovation, strategy, business development, and marketing efforts of many of the world's leading companies, customers like Nestle and Ikea, Diageo, and Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, we help them better invest in the future. Uh, and we do so through a set of targeted products that are powered by a growing network of professionals with startup and hyper growth experience. Uh, we use that network to help our customers surface critical insights, to help them identify actionable opportunities, everything from pilots through acquisitions, uh, and also to hire transformational um, talent. Uh, we believe that the future has never been more important, uh, as I'm sure you do, um, but that doing so effectively navigating that future is, is really hard. Um, and so with these webinars, uh, we're seeking to share perspectives and best practices for people on the forefront of innovation, people like Jay and Jeff and Dave. Um, and we're excited to have Dave moderate this session today. Um, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves, um, but with that, why don't I hand it off to Dave? Um, this is your show. Awesome, thank you, sir. Well, it's a pleasure uh, to be hosting this and it should be a really fun conversation. To set the stage, I know Stu get, did some introductions there, but I'd love for Jay and Jeff both to just take you know, 60 seconds to give a little background on what brought you to the seats that you're in today and what does the current seat kind of cover? So Jay, why don't you start us off? Yeah, long and winding road. So from Knoxville, uh, Tennessee, was went to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio with Mr. Dave Knox here, who's also a, a Miami grad and recruited out of school by Nations Bank at the time into a management associate program. Actually spent 20 years at Bank of America sort of overseeing marketing strategy for every functional part of the company. Um, left and took a couple years off about, I guess, six years ago now, knowing I would jump back in and be a CMO somewhere at a growth company. I'd been angel investing quite a bit in the city and was just really enjoying being close to these growth stories again. So jumped back in, became CMO of a, of a dog company called Bark or BarkBox. Um, BarkBox recently went public four or five months ago, so that's been exciting for them. Uh, was there for... Um, about a year and a half, and then was recruited over to Shake Shack. And now I'm CMO of Shake Shack. Uh, I oversee all of the classic marketing functions. We do all our own design in house, uh, PR, social, guest insights and analytics, brand, have a pretty significant regional marketing team. And then I actually oversee all digital product. So digital product development. So the app, the web, the kiosk, all our delivery partnerships. And then I oversee culinary and supply chain. So do all the culinary strategy, uh, culinary innovation, pricing, and then all our supply chain, which is incredibly challenged right now, actually. And um, here I am. So we're opening one Shake Shack somewhere in the world every three days. Uh, we'll continue to do that for quite a while. Uh, super exciting space, but also a tough space during COVID. So that's what I'm doing. Nice. I, you know, I, I don't think you'll find a CMO who didn't have uh, a winding road to it. I was very much an accidental uh, marketer, having for many years run uh, strategy and analytics departments. I spent six years at a company called Beachbody, which makes direct response and multi-level marketing health products. Um, folks tend to be aware of P90X, Insanity, T25, and others. Um, and we were taking a pretty quantitative model uh, for marketing optimization. And from within the uh, quant seat, especially as the media dollars flowed into more trackable digital channels, um, I started getting questions that were increasingly about marketing optimization. So you know, I've got $100 million to spend on customer acquisition. What's the optimal way to divvy it up? Things like that. And as we started helping the marketers solve uh, optimization problems, one thing led to another. The founders asked if I would manage 
uh, one of the marketing disciplines. We gave them some new uh, tools and uh, data-driven approaches. They made some money. They asked if I would take another. Um, sort of accidentally became a CMO. Um, as uh, chief marketing officer of Shutterstock, I had to sort of learn on the ground uh, how to manage the qualitative side of the house. So brand marketing, product marketing, creative direction, et cetera. Um, and then a couple of years later, when I landed at Shopify, felt like I really had um, an integrated model that used both the left and right brain together um, to do that well. So great couple of years uh, at Shopify. Um, folks tend to know the story of that, um, of that company. And then uh, after having been a public company CMO for a few years said, that was pretty exhausting. Uh, and now uh, at, a, at, a, at a private equity firm called El Catterton, it's the world's largest consumer focused private equity fund with six strategies uh, across the globe, ranging from large cap buyouts uh, to minority growth stage investments. And my role is to work with our portfolio companies to achieve their value creation plans um, so that we can you know, drive growth together. Perfect. So I want to start, you know, this whole webinar is going to be talking about marketing innovation. And I think one of the things you said really interesting there, Jeff, is that you won't meet a CMO that hasn't had a winding path to get where they are today. But if we look a decade ago, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Marketing used to be a pretty linear path up to the C-suite. The What's changed over the last five years that has made that polymath so important to, for the CMO suite? Yeah, I'd say there's probably two main drivers of that. Um, the first is uh, the increasing measurability of the marketing channels. I described a, you know, a migration of media dollars from offline unaddressable channels to targeted online channels that leave digital breadcrumbs, if you will, uh, that lend themselves to, to measurement and to immediate feedback loops that allow you to tweak the approach. Second one is really technology to administer those online marketing treatments. Um, you know, we all uh, have heard the marketing acronyms, um, you know, CRM, CDP, ESP, DSP, DMP, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially they're all tools that serve as elements of a data plumbing system to collect customer or cookie level information and use the intelligence about that customer or cookie to provide a targeted, creative execution, offer, and you know, other forms of treatment. And so I think the, you know, the interplay of um, data feedback loops and technology to deliver experiences based on those data feedback loops is probably the biggest driver of expansion. I'll, I'll sort of editorialize for one moment and say that as a discipline, we're probably at risk of overswinging the pendulum towards those new approaches. I, I frequently now come across you know, what, what you sort of refer to as the CMOs on that nonlinear path, and they get the, the quantitative side of the operation, and they've got, you know, high performing uh, digital marketing operations. But if you ask them, what's the brand position? Who are your key segments? Um, they might not be able to answer. And so I think that um, there was good in what was old too. Um, it's just that the world has broadened for marketers. So let's dive in on that perspective of the performance versus the brand. You know, if you are coming from that world of being more performance driven, growth marketing, et cetera, how do you learn the brand side and how do you get that experience to be able to broaden your skill set there? You want me to take that one? Either. I, I can tell you how I did it. Um, you know, I, I sort of, I, you know, trial by fire, right? I was a CMO. I was hired by a forward thinking company that wanted to run a fairly quantitative operation, but of course there were objectives we had to deliver on the brand side. And so my approach was at least to try to handle it with humility and say, you know, through these incredibly talented people uh, that I had at the VP level, you know, I'm going to tell you uh, what success looks like and give you guardrails for that. You're going to teach me how it's done. Um, and, you know, I think it's okay, uh, especially as the role becomes broader and broader to manage towards delivery of outcomes that you yourself might not tactically know how to achieve. And so that, that was how I, I learned that uh, space. I think it's probably a little bit easier to go from knowing performance to learning brands uh, than vice versa, but certainly either is attainable. Yeah, it's interesting. I came from the opposite background, which was 
a lot of my career was focused on brand and advertising. I mean, I'd spent, I would have probably been in an advertising agency or the advertising world had I not been at Bank of America. Now, the bank was a very quantitative place. So you sort of naturally uh, felt that way. But, you know, the old school idea of marketers are really, they balance art and science in so many ways is never more true than now between brand and performance marketing. When I went to work at BarkBox, the one thing I didn't really know was performance marketing. That was something that we just didn't really do at Bank of America, right? We, I was great at billion dollar ad campaigns, but the, the performance marketing was new. We, were, we spent 70 million a year um, at Bark on performance marketing. It's really what built that company. And so I'd spent a good year and a half deep diving into that. and. Uh, was fascinating and, and sort of was able to then take that to Shake Shack and incorporate the two together, uh, which has been great. But it is hard to just point. It's hard. It's not the same type of brain that is generally an expert at both. So you're probably really strong at one and you kind of have to learn the other by being around great people that do it. And, and I think that's almost every CMO I know has come to that same place with it. So you know, today we're going to talk a lot about innovation, and we think about you know the marketers that came before us. Let's call it twenty years ago, thirty years ago. The marketing toolkit they were working with was TV, print, out of home, the emergence of digital, etc. Today we've emerged into gaming and influencers and metaverse and NFTs and all of this. How do you think, as marketers, we first can even stay on top of all of the choices that are in front of us, and to know what to do with them? before we even dive into if they're the right or the wrong thing for your brand. Yeah, I'll jump in first on that one. I think you just gotta have a culture of experimentation because I, I've said this forever, right? If you go way, way back, um, the newspaper was gonna you know, kill word of mouth, radio was gonna kill the newspaper, television was gonna kill radio, the internet's gonna kill television. And the reality is, almost all these things stay around for long lifespans. Now they may lose share of advertising dollars and so forth, but ultimately as a marketer, our job is to go where the eyeballs are and wherever the eyeballs are focused, ideally at an efficient rate is where we want to put ourselves. And you can only figure that out in these new platforms by experimenting. And I mean, I, I think that like a great strategy we've tried to do is pounce on early social media channels that you have no idea if they're going to take off or not. So in the last three years, if you pounced on Clubhouse and TikTok and Snapchat and House Party and a bunch of others, you'll be bummed that you spent that money on Clubhouse and House Party, but you'll be really excited if you built an early presence on TikTok and Snapchat. And, and so I just think that is kind of the approach you have to be taking is always experimenting and being out there because that's where eyeballs are going and NFTs and crypto. We'll see about some of that. Certainly a lot of that stuff won't pan out that much and, and some of it will pan out in a huge way and ga gaming's clearly here to stay, right? So that's, that's something um, it's already gotten super expensive. So it, it's just constant experimentation, I think, with that. Yeah, I would add to that that I think, um, you know, certainly uh, experimentation is key and that can be in a new channel or an existing channel, uh, experimenting with new creative execution uh, in a channel you've been using forever can still be valuable going after a new segment uh, in a channel you've already been using can be valuable. I think in terms of appetite for trying the latest and greatest, it can also depend a lot on what audience you're dealing with. You know, if you're Shake Shack and you're a part of a cultural zeitgeist, I think the burden to be uh, on TikTok or the latest and greatest may be very different than if you are marketing a B2B software, you know, as an example, and your decision maker is the procurement manager. So I think it depends a lot on who are we really talking to and what perception are we trying to get across. Um, some of it also, I think, depends on where you are in the life cycle of building marketing sophistication. You know, if I said that every um, company I deal with had exhausted what was possible in the traditional channels and was ready uh, to be on the bleeding edge, that wouldn't really be true. And so, um, you know, I try to maintain a balance of experimentation uh, that helps us figure out what's coming next with a, you know, kind of blocking and tackling centric approach that says like, well, do we really have the fundamentals in place 
Uh, and if we were to succeed in X, Y, or Z new platform, how big could that really be today? Um, and that tempers uh, sometimes um, my appetite for, you know, for experimentation. There are, I think, situations, you know, based on the audience and your sophistication where sometimes letting others blaze the path and then picking up the best practices as quickly as you can while less sexy um, may be what's called for if you're, you know, if you're laser focused on driving a certain result. So let's double click on that one a little bit of that, you know, balancing of that experimentation and that business driving, you know, how do you, you know, at one point people would kind of solve that by saying, okay, we're going to have our marketing innovation team that's out there doing it. All they do is their experiments. And then it started being built into the main business. How do you encourage your teams to think about that balance of experimentation and thinking the long-term versus driving the short-term and not meet, missing your weekly, monthly, quarterly goals? Yeah, um, a couple of thoughts on that. One is that I'm not a big believer in innovation as a central function. I think that, you know, everyone's got a domain expertise in a marketing world that's becoming, you know, uh, more and more eye-shaped, sort of narrow and deep. I, at Shopify, I once counted the distinct functions I had in my marketing department, and there were 19 of them. Uh, so people obviously have their own domains. And you know, two adjacent domains might interact and, and overlap to some extent, but um, there were certainly roles that had absolutely nothing to do with one another. And so the notion that any innovator um, could span all of them seems to me a little bit naive. And so uh, not dissimilar to the way I think about, you know, analytics, like everyone's got to be analytical, everyone's got to be innovative. Um, but where I have used uh, more of a center of excellence kind of approach is in terms of administering the tests. Um, I've seen a lot of false negatives uh, driven by poor experimental design. It's like, it's the thing where the social media person comes into your office and they're like, Facebook doesn't work. Okay, how do you know Facebook doesn't work? Well, I added it in target market A and I didn't add it in target market B and they're otherwise the same. Okay, how much did you add? 10,000 a week. How much are you spending in search a week? A million in both geos. It's a drop in the bucket. And so I realized that experiments weren't being designed or read well. Um, and so in some orgs, I would create a center of excellence around testing infrastructure. And then as the uh, operation got more mature, uh, individual pods could take that on on their own. Perfect. Anything to add to that, Jack? No, I think it also depends on who you hire. I think you want to hire people that inherently are both curious and want to become sort of masters of their craft in their particular area and have that sort of um, talent and drive to to want to be experts in that area so they're constantly pushing and and then let them run right let them dedicate most of their funds to what's working and constantly have a percentage of what you budget for them focus on experimenting and be comfortable with failing on on some or even all of that percentage in any given quarter so that that's kind of also how i think about it as well wonderful well, first off, a reminder to the audience to throw in your questions. We've got ones we're going to be going through here, but please add in and we'll be incorporating them throughout this or capturing at the end as we get going. So moving on to kind of the next thing of thinking about innovation, you know, what would you say the biggest challenges are for marketers today? Around innovation or around just marketers overall? Overall, because innovation should address the things you're faced with, hopefully. I mean, I would say overall, there's never been more pressure on marketers, I think, to drive sales. And when you think about driving sales and traffic, um, all the tools now to do that, because it used to be the days you only had retail stores or you were a digital business and that was your sole focus, et cetera. Whereas now, um, Shake Shack is as much of a digital company as we are as a physical company in many ways. And so, you know, my responsibility is to create a guest experience that leads to also driving sales for our current guests. Do you build loyalty programs? Do you build CI, CRM dialogue streams? Do you build all that? Are you a brand creative guru? Because you got to go out there and make magic happen. But then also, are you driving sales and traffic into the into our shacks at a high level through all these channels. And, you know, that is a polymath and also just more difficult than I think this, the, the marketing, the CMO who 15 years ago was 
buying some media, doing some advertising, managing an agency, uh, it's just gotten much, much more broad and dynamic. Yeah, I, I would, I agree with that and would add, um, and, you know, this is related to something I said earlier that, uh, you know, the increasing obsession of our discipline with measurement and with immediacy of measurement has caused an imbalance of supply and demand in certain digital marketing channels. I think it was in Facebook's last quarterly call that they said the cost of an impression had gone up 50%. Um, and, you know, that's in an environment where impressions, I believe, rise something like 8% a year and demand for them obviously uh, rises a lot more than that. Hence, you know, the, the effect on pricing. Um, you know, that and the flood of CRM treatments that led to new privacy regulation um, are creating new challenges, but we're still left as a discipline uh, with the demands of CFOs who have come to expect that everything will now be measurable, immediately measurable, and measurable in the specific, not just in the aggregate. So it's no longer good enough to say the marketing program produced X. Okay, was the display line item valuable? You know, you got to prove that one out too. And so um, our eagerness for that has sort of left us with the burden of delivering against it at a time when the channels that most drove it are becoming uh, unsustainably expensive. I think that's a pretty big challenge that, uh, um, that marketers are facing and, 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 and leads directly to what we described a moment ago, which is the need to test into you know, new and effective channels. With that as the backdrop then, how do you test into those new channels when some of them might not have that measurability? And how do you manage up and manage across with your cross-functional peers of, we convinced them that you can measure marketing. Now we've convinced them too much that you can measure marketing. So how do you prove out the potential of these new channels? Yeah, um, I'm a big believer in modeling everything, even if it's unknowable. This was sort of a philosophy I developed when I, when I you know, came to manage brand marketers as well. I remember very clearly someone uh, in the events space saying like, you know, can I throw 10 more parties for the enterprise segment? And I said, well, like, what's it worth? And she said, well, I don't know how many people are going to show up and I don't know what proportion of them will become leads. And I don't know how many of them our sales team would convert. And I said, okay, but those are still the levers, right? Like, let's go and put assumptions and ranges against each of those. Uh, if we're wrong at minimum, we will have thought through in a pretty uh, clear way what the levers are, you know, so always valuable to know the mechanics of how something works, but also let's put plausible ranges against them. And if those plausible ranges, you know, say we still can't hit the number, then we're not going to do that. Um, and if they say that we could be in the ballpark, cool, let's, let's give it a try. Maybe we'll have a feedback loop or not. But I'm a big fan of modeling everything, as I say. And, and you know, even when I introduced uh, performance marketing exclusive regimes to brand marketing for the first time, I would guide and say, like, look, in this calendar year, the budget is going to be negatively affected by the introduction of brand marketing. Here's a five-year model that shows how the halo we create by spending every year in brand marketing over the performance marketing funnel in the out years actually leads to a more profitable five-year result than if we don't do it at all. And so, you know, it was a model that said, yes, every year we're gonna have increased marketing spend, but beginning in year two or year three, you're going to see increased conversion through the performance marketing funnel, a higher mix of organic versus paid traffic and the like. And it's an illustrative model. I don't, you know, can I prove out that that's exactly how it's gonna happen? No, but it's gotta be plausible. Um, and I think that's what allows you to get into at least a philosophical conversation that it could work, uh, even if you know it's unknowable today that it will. Yeah, it's true. I'd add, you know, the challenge here is that, especially in consumer marketing, if you look back 10, 20, 50, and 100 years, a lot more brands have been built from purely qualitative brand work than have been built from performance marketing. A lot more great companies. Like there's that famous line, right? 50% of my marketing is wasted. I just don't know which 50%. And the guy that said that said that in the 1800s, which I think is amazing. And if you just try to build a brand off performance marketing, there have been a few that have done it, but for the most part, you can't do that. And that is the challenge of a of a CMO to convince a CEO, a CFO and others to fund a lot of brand work that just won't work. One quick interesting story is I used to tell like at Bank of America, you know, when we looked at the insurance business, so insurance is sort of a, a cousin to banking. And when you think about what totally made three dominant players in insurance 
Geico, Aflac, and oh, I think about the third that I sometimes name, you know, Geico was somebody went in there and said, hey, why don't we make a lizard and a caveman the kind of face? And Aflac was like, let's make a duck that just comes out of the water and says Aflac. And literally they dominated those businesses and forced Allstate and State Farm and all these other guys to come up with their own wacky campaigns and spend billions of dollars of advertising. And that was purely done by creatives that were able to convince boards to spend huge money on ads around that. And so I, I just think that that's an illustrative lesson to think about, like, you got to have both. And if you're really going to break through now, it may be more with organic social media. It may be more with having Travis Scott use his meal for your restaurant, right? Like it seems it would make no sense or the influencer marketing, et cetera, but there's going to be that balance like all the time. And that's where, that's where it gets tough. That's where the art comes in. By, by the way, I would add to that if, if the uh, you know the the marketer who came up with the Geico Gecko had run five hundred dollars in search or you know social media ads against it, they would not have gotten the results that said you should continue. You know, and and so right. it was a bigger bet over a longer time horizon that paid off. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's so dead on. So when we think about all these tools that are out there today, you know, there's these emerging you know, pick the buzzword, NFTs, metaverse, TikTok, esports, social selling, go down, down the list. What's been the tools over the last 12 months that you've been spending the most time experimenting with? The ones that, that I've experimented with the most, and, you know, keep in mind that I'm, I'm now working with middle market, uh, private equity backed firms that are maybe in a different place on their uh, marketing sophistication journey. Um, but it's really been get, getting out of having just one hero channel, typically social. Yeah, you'll see a lot of companies. And by the way, these can be companies with hundreds of millions of revenue. So I'm not talking about embryonic, uh, you know, uh, regimes, but, you know, they could spend over 50% on just Facebook or just Instagram. And so, you know, um, the ones that are being rewarded, by the way, as digital marketing expense goes way up are the ones that have the broadest based approach. Um, I don't know if that's a function of just portfolio effect and they had bets placed uh, multiple places or if there's a more, you know, nonlinear path to purchase than, than folks are typically seeing. But um, for many of them, it's just getting out of having one hero channel, typically very bottom funnel and moving into connected TV, moving into having a, you know, robust influencer program. Um, getting on YouTube, you know, uh, things that are sort of near cousins of search and social, which is typically where their where their bets have been placed. And that, that's why I say that, like, the question around innovation to me is also, you know, what's innovation that you need to produce the business result? I don't know that all the companies I deal with need to be in NFTs today. If they can move from social, um, you know, to connected TV and, you know, uh, and influencer programs, you know, with good partner management at scale, that's uh, probably a more reliable way to move them forward. Uh, you know, would that everyone was optimized across everything and just needed NFTs to complete the picture, but that's, you know, I don't know that that's the real world. Yeah. How about Jay with Shake Shack and the uh, emergence of digital ordering? As you mentioned, you guys are as much a digital company today. And I think I saw the other day that Shake Shack orders, it's something like 48% of your orders are now coming in from digital channels before somebody even gets into a Shake Shack. So how uh, what have you guys been experimenting with with that Im massive uh, shift in digital commerce? One is just building a digital product and tech organization that can handle that and the data infrastructure to make great decisions throughout it. When you think about just even our UX design, our optimization of flow and purchasing, these are all fairly new things for us. You know, we were excited when I got here two and a half years ago, we just launched an app that we could take orders and we were super fired up about that. You know, now uh, when you talk about that type of business and just for perspective, pre-COVID, 15% of our orders came in through the app, the web, or delivery. And uh, two weeks afterwards, it went to 85% after COVID broke out. And it's now fallen down to about 50. And I'm not sure it's going to go down that much farther than that. So this was a sea change for us of just like, 
it accelerated a lot of our investments that we were going to do anyway, but accelerated that massively. But all the infrastructure parts going on. You think about the way we merchandise our product and menu just in digital channels. We never done that before. Didn't know how to do it. Didn't do A B testing. You know, we didn't do a lot of a lot of that basic stuff that we're just now um, kind of getting better at. Um, so I think that. Uh, that's where I'm putting some of the resources to optimize just our frequency and average check and retention. And do you make this decision to build a loyalty program if you're a digital business right now, which can cost you a lot of money? I mean, look at places like Target and Sweetgreen built loyalty programs and then blew them up completely because they were costing them a bunch of money. They were just paying their best customers to repeatedly, you know, eat or purchase for them. And that investment in loyalty and the data capabilities that you need for that and um, even the finance and tax issues that go along with that, it's, it's a lot. And so I, I, that's where you take a lot of small bets on innovating in these digital channels or testing in things like television, radio, print, out of home, going back to some mass media that we haven't done a ton of at Shake Shack. Or you start to say, do I put that money in improving my current digital channels and, um, and optimizing the flow through those channels that we have and build maybe a loyalty program, et cetera. So that's all, all the things I'm thinking about and there are no easy answers to those. Um, you just gotta really to be measuring it as Jeff says and, and figuring out where you're getting the biggest impact for the dollar. Jay, two things I, I would react to if, uh, if it's all right in what you said. One is that you, know, you basically described a company that had to go through a digital transformation, right? To use the buzzword. And, and I think you said some really important things that might've been critical uh, to success. When I see sort of analog type companies attempt a digital transformation and don't you know, fail to achieve the, the metrics you just described, um, it's often because they think of uh, digital product the way one would think of an IT implementation. They say, oh, like it's something in the technological world and they put the CIO uh, in charge of building the app, well, then it starts to look like an ERP implementation. Uh, you mentioned having a head of digital product. And I think that for anyone contemplating a digital transformation, understanding that digital product is really the driver um, you know, of the customer experience in the digital world and that you need a standalone product function that isn't buried somewhere in IT uh, to go through that transformation is, is super, super important. The other thing you spoke about that I think is going to be increasingly important is sort of loyalty and, and CRM programs. Um, I've been experimenting for a while with ways to shift the customer acquisition burden to traditional CRM channels as the expense of digital acquisition goes up. And so I think we're gonna see loyalty mechanics earlier in the customer life cycle more and more. An example is something like, you know, someone hits uh, your page, you don't wanna retarget them forever because again, cost is going up, up, up. What kind of value exchange can we create on the landing page, whether it's a quiz or a light piece of tooling or something like that, that will induce the customer to leave an email address or a phone number. Now we can shift the burden for conversion uh, to own channels that are much less expensive. And so I think, you know, loyalty and leveraging first party data higher and higher up in the funnel is going to be one of the most important, uh, you know, innovative offsets to the uh, increasing cost of the digital channels. Totally, it's so true. Loyalty light is what we call it before we go to a on, full on loyalty program. It's like, what are those loyalty light? Do we just at least recognize you and recognize what you ordered last time and say, hey, we know that you love chocolate shakes. And we have this new chocolate, you know, with milk bar coming out right now that you got to try. I mean, uh, those are the steps you need to make before you move on to that full on like loyalty program and so forth. So that that's exactly the way we think about it too. I like that loyalty light. I'm going to start using that. Yeah. I'm going to trade like that. Yeah. So yeah, one of the things that we've, uh, we've talked, both talked about a lot is first party data, data, loyalty, all of that. You know, one of the things that's emerged in the last few years is this increase in data has also had the unintended consequence that as marketers, we have to start thinking about cybersecurity and responsibility of the data that we're generating and holding, et cetera. How have you started working with your cross-functional counterparts to uh, deal with the byproduct of all the data that you're generating? This is one that I think, and I'm curious what Jay has to say, as a discipline, we have to figure out how to do better. 
Um, I've have implemented, uh, you know, in bigger organizations, especially like at Shopify, cross-functional processes of approval before adding data elements, before targeting in a certain way. But what that typically looks like in practice is someone, either a channel owner or a product, you know, a project manager, sending emails over the wall to, to legal um, or security, you know, within, within IT. And I think there's going to have to be some way uh, to bring that knowledge into the marketing function, um, because it's just too costly every time you, you know, you cross disciplines uh, to get like a workflow item out the door. But I don't have a, a great answer for what a steady state should look like. It's something we're going to have to, you know, figure out how to make part of the core capability of a marketing department, I think. Love that. So let's dive into some of the, uh, the questions that the audience has. So uh, Alana asked the question of, what are you most excited about in the future of marketing, either at your company or the overall industry? I mean, the beauty of being in marketing is it's always changing. You know, there is always a new expertise to learn uh, or to bring into your organization or to run down. I mean, there is nothing... I tell that to people, young people that are thinking about which career path to go down. And like, you know, if you work in a lot of certain areas in finance or tech or so, tech, tech, of course, is changing. But if you specialize, you're going to be in that thing for a long time. And marketing is constantly just this process of innovation. Uh, otherwise, you, you don't, you know, you don't see a lot of old, I think about this a lot. You don't see a lot of old CMOs. <laughs> and part of it is because that can get way ahead of you if you're not with it and staying on top of it very, very quickly and hiring great people to do it. Like, and I can't tell you what's going to work on TikTok exactly. I have a bunch of young people that use TikTok all day and they are great at coming up with content on TikTok and we'll, we'll hire more of those. But so, but that excites me. I love that, you know, you can bring like 25 year olds into the organization that know about these channels and can, can build a real measurable impact there. Um, because they are of that thing in that place. Um, so I'm excited about that just ongoing process of like, what's next? What's the next thing? And in crypto, if you work in that space at all, where's that going to go? Um, gaming is, a, is, as you mentioned earlier, is an interesting one. And then how do you balance that with traditional sports? Because if all this money is running to gaming, maybe the entry into um, you know, Major League Baseball and catching your guests that happens to love baseball and burgers, maybe that got cheaper than it was 10 years ago. And that gets more efficient. I just think a lot about where is the efficiency um, at the moment and how can I apply budget and talent there? Uh, and that I find that super invigorating along with just the constant creative process. What creatively out there is moving people? You know, if you're if you're a great marketer, I think is also a bit of a tastemaker. If they're not a tastemaker, they are following tastemakers closely. And you are thinking like, how do I stay in the fabric of the conversation? How do I put myself out there in provocative ways that don't go too far? How do I think about playing in a lot of the value-based discussions that are happening out there or not playing in them? could be social justice, racial inequality, right? Like we've had huge movements around that. In our space, we also think about sustainability in ESG, which is getting bi bigger for so many companies. I, so I'm giving you a grab bag, but those are all the things that I think you have to be excited by and have some expertise in if you wanna work in this space at sort of a high level. I can add to that uh, a little bit. I, I absolutely echo this notion of um, brands now being held responsible responsible for social positions. They take, on the one hand, that can seem like a burden if you're a CMO, um, but I actually find that invigorating, both the part um, in terms of, you know, how do you uh, stay just on the right line of being, uh, you know, responsible, but not to, uh, you know, and, and being part of the conversation, but not being um, over the line and too pr provocative. Um, but I also like that it shifts the burden a lot from what brands say to what they do. 
And so it's no longer enough to say like, oh, I support Black Lives Matter. It's like, well, what did you do about that? You know? Um, and I think as brands become uh, actors and not just commentators, um, I think that's actually, uh, um, it's a burden, but it can also be an opportunity, you know, and it, it forces companies to put their money where their mouths are uh, in terms of in terms of social issues. The other one that didn't come up yet that I'm, I don't know if I'm excited for it as so much as I'm curious to know where it goes is AI. When you ask people in general, where are you on AI? It's like, oh, you know, it's a silver bullet. It's going to fix everything. It's great. And then I ask people, okay, like if I'm in a room of marketers, I'll say, how many people are actively using, you know, first party AI, not, you know, in some Google uh, environment that you're bidding in, you know, to run significant parts of your marketing department? Crickets, you know, no one's doing it. And I've been bearish. I've said that like, as long as AI keeps making very simple correlation mistakes, um, I can't use it. I've, I've tried a number of the off the shelf tools that say, oh, we'll just figure out what the next logical product is for each of your customers. Don't worry how we do it. It's, it's AI, it's an algorithm. Cool. Um, they just, they get it wrong. They don't work. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't, maybe this will get a lot better, but I'm just really curious more than I'm, more than I'm specifically bearish or bullish. I think it's going to be a longer time coming than, than people who, when, you know, when asked in generalities will say it's like, around the corner, but in specific, they don't use it. Uh, I don't know of anyone who does. Uh, so I'm just curious to see where that goes. Makes sense. So jump into another one from the, the audience. So Jim asked, how do you measure the effect on brand when pulling all these different levers that affect the behavior of customers? He says, I know from my personal experience has been that certain brands have been cheapened by excessive discounting on their online ordering. They won the battle to get me to buy once, but the brand is suffering in my psyche. Discounts have always been a race to the bottom. And, you know, this is where a lot of traditional marketing, knowing history can really help you. And that's where uh, these uh, certain brands get in trouble that have dynamos sort of at the helm early, but they fall into longstanding traps, right? I mean, all you got to do is look at Anybody that gets in a pricing and discount count war is a race to the bottom. Uh, if you want to have a pristine brand, a fantastic aspirational brand, and yet you're discounting it all the time, um, you know, what are you saying about the value, how you value your own brand and, and for your guests? So you got to figure that out. And people that rely on discounts all the time are going to be in trouble. They might as well just lower the floor of what anyone is going to pay for their product. So one of the things is like being careful of some of those rules that are kind of out there that don't seem to change a whole lot. Um, the first part of that question of how do you measure the brand is as you get to a certain level, starting to get a certain amount of ongoing quantitative research on your brand. So we have a brand health tracker now at, at Shake Shack that we track basically all our purchase funnel met metrics on a quarterly basis. And we say, what is our awareness? aided, unaided, you know, consideration, favorability, likelihood to purchase. And we score ourselves now nationally and to some degree regionally. And, you know, you get to a certain size, you can start to do that. And then when we, we have never run a big mass advertising campaign, we really never needed to, but at some point we will. And when we do, we'll now have a foundation to be able to measure that through that brand health tracker, uh, which has been really great for us. So that is one way that we measure brand, but it's always the biggest brands of the world debate on this. It's never an easy, easy answer. I think it also comes back to something we discussed earlier about time horizons, right? Like this uh, notion that, you know, something that we try must work and work overnight is a short-termism that I think has fueled a lot of the discount behavior we see. And so being explicit about what we want to achieve and over what time horizon is important. And as a marketer, I like to surface those trade-offs. Like, yes, we can be more promotional in this period. Here's what the likely consequence is over a year or two. CEO, CEOs don't always want to hear that, but it's important to, you know, to have those conversations. I also, by the way, I should, shouldn't say I, Elk Hatterton has a brand tracker for many of our uh, companies that runs continuously and every day, you know, additional sample comes in. So you can look at a rolling period starting at, starting at any moment. Um, and that's a good way to gauge uh, if you're move, moving the, the metrics. I actually worry less about the things we could be doing that are eroding brands and more about, you know, how, what are we doing to raise, uh, you know, awareness and consideration uh, north of the performance marketing that most digitally native companies have down. 
you know, it's, it's really what you're doing above that that I think needs to be tracked. I want to go back to one thing Jeff said too, and this is kind of slightly provocative, which is the values discussion and CMOs needing to play a role in how they speak about values. And there have been lots of opportunities to do that well and poorly um, over the last uh, couple of years in particular. And one of the things is like at Shake Shack, I talk about, we are everywhere in the country and the world, but we are a very New York, our headquarters is in New York City. We are very of New York City. I manage a large team of very, uh, you know, left-leaning New Yorker progressive folks, but we have shacks in every part of the country and we try to both stick to our values and what's important to us, but I'm really trying to focus, especially younger people on, hey, you got to get out in the world. You got to get out in the country and visit these other places because like if I know a lot of people that don't even know someone that voted for Donald Trump and half the country voted for Donald Trump. So when you think about taking stances that you know, you're like, everybody believes this. Well, usually they don't. And you just gotta be really sure that you are willing to um, take maybe a side of that, that there's gonna be another side that is not gonna like it or disagree with it. And, and that's a hard conversation for a lot of people to have, but it's an important one as a company on where you stand on all those things. And especially if you're a consumer marketing business, welcome to your future, because there's gonna be a lot more of that uh, over the next several years. Yeah, so a question on that one is, uh, so Anheuser-Busch announced, I think it was earlier this year, that they were opening these consumer experience centers in four or five cities across the country. You know, you know, not only New York, but also Miami and Austin and St. Louis and different places with that in mind of they needed the teams to be closer to the wide swath of demographics. So how do you get your team to do that and get that experience short of, opening a bunch of offices in different places or spending a ton of money to fly them all over the place? I actually think that there's sort of two answers to it. Uh, there's the, hey, like people get out there, you know, uh, don't insulate yourself, don't listen only to the echo chamber. And that's just sort of part of your jobs, like innovation. You know, we said everyone should be innovative. Um, but I think there's also, it start, sort of starts with this understanding that you are not the target market, you know, and it's, it's gotta be, you know, your positioning has to be research driven. I, one thing I never forget is, um, nice. One thing I never forget is, uh, like the first day of marketing research class in business school, they, they send out these surveys and it was like, you know, this is, I went to, to grad school right here in New York and it was like, well, what percentage of beer that's consumed in America is imported? Okay, everyone can think of a number in their head. And the other question was, what percent of households in the U.S. have Jello in them? You know, and again, everyone can think of the number. Well, a bunch of New Yorkers sitting around figure at least 20% of beers imported. It's like 1%. You know, most people drink domestic beer and would never guess that. Again, I don't quote me on the number, but it was something north of 50% of households that stock Jello. Uh, whereas like, you know, Manhattan households, it's probably a lower number. And, you know, the lesson they were getting across is you are not the target market. Now, that's not to suggest uh, that every position we take, especially on these important values driven issues should be driven by what research says folks want to hear. I think it's important to know which is the set of things that our values dictate we must do a certain way, certain way, you know, other people's opinions be damned and we're willing to suffer for that. Uh, you know, which are the ones that we're willing to position ourselves around uh, because they're sales drivers and not critical to our, you know, longer term identity or values. So I think, you know, being rigorous about separating those things is important, um, but you are not the target market. And it's like, it's worth starting by understanding that. So true. I love that. We've got time for one uh, final question I want to toss out, which is, you know, you both had mentioned you follow inspiration from others. You know, you look at what other brands are doing, where people lean in, tastemakers. You know, who are your favorite tastemakers, whether they're people, brands, or anything else there that you use for that inspiration? That's always a great question. I think, and in, in one of the things that I miss a little bit, I, I actually had a rare couple hours to watch some football this weekend and it was so fun watching all the television advertising because I don't watch a lot I just don't see a lot of ads anymore the way I consume media and it was fascinating to see you know and it made me realize like man I really got to watch find a way to watch more ads in that way somehow um 
because I love just being around. And I think, you know, in the peak of television advertising, like 15, 20 years ago, you know, the most creative minds in the world were working on a lot of that advertising. I mean, you think of the Super Bowls where it's like just one brilliant ad after the next um, back in the day that that shifted quite a bit. I look at great brands. I just you always got to look at like where the smartest, most creative people in the world are going. Um, if it's Apple or Nike or, you know, great consumer brands and kind of what they're doing and what they're touching along with great um, emerging brands. It could be brands like Yeti or Glossier or, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of fashion brands that are on the cutting edge of what they're doing and seeing how they're connecting. So I follow those people. I think there's sort of mid media influencers out there that are just, I find really smart. I've subscribed to a bunch of newsletters you know, Scott Galloway uh, in New York, Fred Wilson, I get his uh, ABC um, email, which I think is really good every day. Um, it's just following a lot of, again, those tastemakers and seeing what's on their mind. Uh, because again, you gotta be art in touch with arts and culture if you're gonna be a brand a brand marketer. Um, and, and then lastly, group, I would say, and this is part of what I've been missing a little bit is Pre-COVID, you know, one advantage of sort of being a CMO is you get to go to some of these CMO dinners and invited to some of these different places. And sometimes those can be tedious, but also you sometimes meet really interesting people and, and build relationships where you hear what we were happy to do a partnership with Milk Bar the other day. And I went to lunch with the Milk Bar CMO and, you know, we were sharing just so many interesting insights and I've kind of missed that during COVID because I haven't done as much of that. It's been so insular. And so I'm trying to get back more into that. Just your peer group of, uh, hey, what are you guys doing? What's working? What's not working? On the, on the brand side, I think, I almost think about it in two buckets. I think there's, you know, the big inspiration bucket. These are, you know, agency-driven uh, creative executions. They're winning Can Lions Awards. And I think that's one thing to look at. I'll say at least the second best in the burger category is probably Burger King. They've done some incredible things right. over the last few years, really, um, you know, livening up that space. I always think of the one uh, out of home execution is just like a giant moldy burger. You know, we're so used to seeing this like impossibly fresh food that other than Shake Shack doesn't mirror our experience with, uh, with some of the others. Um, so I think that you've got ones like that that are out there and are sort of, you know, high creative art. Um, in that sense, but I also look at, at, I think this is partly because I'm in a, uh, in a private equity firm that has a portfolio of brands, in many cases, trying to achieve functional goals. Like one brand that I've really admired recently is Backcountry. You know, they've kind of gone to market with this notion of, we are of the, uh, of, of the environment that our customers are. And they've got these executions where, you know, the would-be snowboarder calls and says, you know, oh, I'm wondering how warm this jacket is. And then the, you know, the person on the, on the sales or customer service ends of the line launches into this long diatribe about how when they were out in Alaska in the freezing cold, it, it's that warm, you know, and it's like, we are of your community. Um, I think that's been probably very effective and impactful, um, but it's a really different kind of approach, but it's, it's a lesson I can take for one of the portfolio companies I work on, none of whom, by the way, or very few of whom I should say, are going out to, you know, bring in, you know, Droga to do, a, a lion's winning uh, kind of execution. So it's also like, what are you trying to achieve? That's perfect. Well, I think that's a wonderful place to end on. So really appreciate you guys joining us, sharing your perspective of how you're thinking about marketing innovation, how you're driving your organizations and yourself to continually stay top of mind. So I'll turn it over to Stu to uh, wrap us up real quick. Awesome. Uh, Jeff, Jay, that was great. I really appreciate your times. Uh, appreciate your perspectives, Dave. Thank you for leading an engaging conversation. Thank you all for attending and those uh, who will watch this on the socials. Um, we'll be uh, doing an upcoming webinar on open innovation, uh, which is related to our conversation today. So look for that. Uh, any questions, excuse me, or uh, interesting topics you want to hear, shoot me a note. Um, and I uh, want to thank the panelists again and have a great uh, afternoon. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Dave, for moderating. Thanks, Jay. Pleasure. For being on. Talk Thanks. soon. See you guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Great. Bye.